Rob's Child, no investment advice. Welcome back to the series where we review every chapter of Benjamin Graham's The Intelligent Investor Revised Edition from 1972. The purpose of this series is to review the chapter's contents, see how they might apply to things going on today in July 2024 as of the recording of this video, and how the contents may relate to security analysis his biblical version of security analysis uh, from 1940. Today's chapter is on chapter, it's chapter 12, things to consider about per share earnings, also known as EPS, if you, that is the short term for that, earnings per share. This is how much money is the company making after it's able to pay its interest on its borrowed money uh, from bonds and its expenses. So the chapter starts off uh, with a quote I'll say, uh, I'll put in here, this chapter will begin with two pieces of advice to the investor that cannot be they cannot avoid being contradictory in their implications. The first is don't take a single year's earnings seriously. The second is if you do pay attention to short-term earnings, look out for booby traps in the per share figures. If you read the chapter, which I hope you did, and this is just a review because that's the best way to do it, you'll know that you know that's largely what this chapter is all about is figuring out how to deal with earnings and per share earnings. And we have some concrete ways of thinking of it that he comes up with at the end. So then most of the chapter, in fact, I think the entire chapter is about this aluminum company, uh, which I think accounted for what he said, 10% of the weight of the Dow. So a huge company, hugely important company in, in that time. Um, and so we, we start the conversation by discussing how uh, fully diluted EPS can vary greatly from the basic earnings per share and how that can be pro problematic, especially if there's uh, warrants that are not accounted for, you know, the, the, there's these shares that don't exist that will exist in the future and, you know, um, how that can be sort of problematic, but he doesn't see that as the biggest problem. Um, I uh, my, I write I my, my take on this is why is it not standard practice to value PE on full dilution and I don't know I, I think the main thing is that usually dilution is not a major issue but that's not even the biggest issue with the aluminum company um, yeah and so he states that convertibles don't uh, make a difference but the warrants do um, you know a bigger difference anyway and then the main complaint that we talk about, he talks about this a lot in a lot in security analysis, uh, dealing with special charges. He's basically complaining that special of special charges not counting towards normal earnings. Uh, and he writes a long, you know, diatribe on how this example should probably not count at count this as special charges uh, because these future charges are just really normal business they are only counting the sunny hours as he puts in the book uh in the earnings per share instead of counting you know all of the normal expenses of a business uh, calling them special and leaving them out is only like it's like you're only counting the good things that are happening you know it's like you're getting a grade for a class and you're all you're saying well look at that a and that a and that a and that a and you know you're forgetting about the five f's that you got and just telling everyone you have an a in the class because look at all the a's but anyway there, there's a lot of ways to illustrate that but moving on purpose of this is to make the bad year um you know in this case the accountants basically the economy was doing poorly in 1970 and everyone said oh everything's so bad so these company apparently used this to its advantage and it said yeah um it will say they counted future charges sorry the volume they counted future potential well known charges all on the bad year and then you know, the whole point of this is to make the following year's earnings not count those charges that would normally be in those years, and then it's going to look so much better, giving it, you know, 
Uh, it's, it's manipulative. It's very, very manipulative any way you look at it. And I, I agree with Graham, and it's surpri almost surprising that there wasn't more regulation. Maybe there wasn't enough uh, people knowledgeable enough to make proper regulation in this area and in, in this time. Again, I, I'm not sure how all of this applies to today uh, myself. But um, anyway, m moving on, the point of all of this is just be careful with reading too much into single... Um, earning per share reports as one one report can be manipulative it, they can take charges from the they can you know not count depreciation that has been building up until all of a sudden they want to count all of it one year um or in this case uh count uh future special charges you know front run it and say yeah it totally cut into our earnings this year um and uh, not even into the basic earnings, only in, you know into the uh, earnings, including the special charges. Which, yeah, it seems like it was a manipulative situation. Then we <clears throat> have a discussion on how taxes can play all into it all. I'm going to add here uh, to modernize this conversation a little bit that you know tax law changes can and do affect companies massively. Uh, I'll even add to that just saying it how you know obviously there's a lot of companies that make all of their money from the government that the government hires the company to make the things that they need think Boeing think you know gun manufacturers think um, all all sorts of uh, companies the biggest one I think is Raytheon something like that but anyway um, and then I wrote here to think of, you know, electric vehicle tax credits, for example, and how much of that's propped up Tesla uh, recently. And how, uh, if you look into the electric vehicle market, it's, it's not looking pretty. So many of these companies are now just, they've lost so much money on these vehicles and nobody, they're not selling enough of them. And, uh, Nobody really wants them. And part of what propped them up was these tax credits. And these companies are trying to take advantage of that. And uh, it, it looks like a mess. Whenever the government tends to get involved with business, uh, it, it does tend to get pretty messy. Uh, this is, you know, not the government's first rodeo, uh, getting, them and getting themselves involved with uh, business. But I digress. I have a five-point star here. A quote, stock valuations are really dependable only in exceptional cases. In other words, whenever you look at the a stock price, if it actually makes sense <laughs> and is dependable, you know, it's, it's a very, very rare situation. Just showing how crazy, uh, you know, Mr. Market, he's, as he likes to call him, can get. Um, Again, I'll, I'll bring up Mr. Market again just because it's on my mind, and I, I love his illustration of it earlier in the book. You know, the it's like a guy coming, knocking on your door, you know, uh, every day wanting to buy your car, let's say, and one day he's asking, hey, I'll buy it for $5,000, and then he come, comes back the very next day and says, I'll give you a 5500 for it, and the next day he says, oh, I'll give you 4000 for it, you know, and that, that's how... Mr. Market works. That's how the stock valuations actually work. It's like a crazy person um, uh, controlling this thing. It's it's how it's just how it works. Sorry about all the light changes. My lamp is going crazy. Mr. Market must be in charge of it. Uh, so we have a quote here for for most investors. It would probably be best to assure themselves that they are getting a good value for the prices they pay and let it go at that so you know and that's like his big theme is like know what is like a cheap price from your perspective and if it's at that price or lower than that price buy it and then forget about it you know and if it's way above what you think of as a fair price maybe get rid of it you know that's the whole that's his entire like world of investing that's just the way he operates and thinks and, and works. 
It's how he gets advantages in markets. It's how a lot of his predecessors, a lot of people that follow his uh, methodologies have been able to achieve the, the golden you know, 30% uh, yearly return uh, that so many investors uh, seek to try to achieve. Moving on, uh, we have a section call, uh, called Use of Average Earnings. And it's a short, surprisingly short section and basically sums up that it is good and it can help alleviate the aforementioned uh, problem, aforementioned, aforementioned, sorry, problem regarding, you know, special charges or, you know, trying to crunch all the charges into one year. It's like, well, if you average it over time, then it doesn't matter because those charges would have been spread out over that time anyway uh especially you know the, the again the reason he says seven to ten years is because it is assumed that we're going through one full business cycle again i will mention again here in 2024 some people believe we haven't had a real business cycle uh since the year like 2000 how the bailout of 2007 kind of put a band-aid on a bigger problem um but that's a discussion for another day Actually, no, I'll just say it now. So the, the point is is that, you know, PE ratios have been very elevated since 2000 and, you know, um, you know, it, eventually it will, I think it will come to roost and it will, you know, we will have a great normalization of stock valuations because of the fact that the form of stock investment hasn't changed. A stock isn't intrinsically worth more than it used to be 10, 20, 50 years ago. Um, seeing as though so many stocks are priced that way today and so much of the value of stocks are priced that way today is very worrisome, and w which is why I, um, you might call me a perma bear at this point if you've been following me and my show and what I've been saying. but. You know, we'll we'll see. Very, it'll be very interesting to see how this cutting cycle uh, happens. Uh, it's expected right now in July of 2024 that the uh, we have a 100% chance of the first rate cut after the epic hiking cycle uh, to start in September. But we're not here to talk about that. We're not here to talk about the book mostly. So let's move on. Now we have a next section on calculation of the past growth rate. Um, and he, you know, basically says that it's prime importance to ta to take the past growth rate adequately into account. He carefully chooses his words there. I wanted to quote it. And then I have a six star point uh, quote. We suggest that the growth rate itself be calculated by comparing the averages of the last three years with the corresponding figures ten years earlier. I found this very interesting. I never came across this way of figuring out the growth rate from security analysis. I don't even see it online. I asked ChatGPT these kinds of things and it can't give me a straight answer. This is the straight answer, straight from the horse's mouth. I'll, I'm going to repeat it. Um, you know, To find the growth rate, according to this book anyway, a lot of ways of doing this, but comparing the average of the last three years with the corresponding figure 10 years earlier. So, you know, basically maybe eight years ago, nine years ago, and 10 years ago, um, you know, the average of those three years, and that that can give you a decent idea of what the growth rate is. You know, I'll also say with, especially with AI technology coming out, and being so cheap and easy to use and as of right now in 2024 chat gpt seems to their free version seems to be using uh searching the live internet now and so you know you can have it do this for you and it's it's like instant and you know figuring out uh growth rates and it can even use the you know much more complicated um formulas like the the i think it's called gaap uh, method of accounting, which basically takes all the numbers into account and averages out the growth rate over 10 years. And I think he, he would uh, highly approve of this. This is obviously like a cheap, easy way to do it, which is not really necessary anymore in 2024 because it's too easy to get uh, more 
specific, accurate uh, numbers yourself um, these days. But anyway, uh, moving on, uh, he discusses oddities in changes of PE ratios, stating how high, uh, <coughs> he states, and I quote here, high multipliers have been man maintained in the stock market only if the company has maintained better than average prof profitability. And I, I note this today hugely. If a company's earnings suddenly gets bigger and bigger and bigger, all of a sudden the market starts pricing it like that's just going to keep going on and on and on for 5, 10, 15 years. And, um, you know, it, it, it just doesn't work that way. Uh, not exactly. It can, but um, when the price gets so ahead of itself, it's it gets dangerous, as I've been talking ad infinitum now in like every, all of my videos on this channel. But anyway, let's let's just get through the chapter. <clears throat> the uh, aluminum company drops from seventy dollars a share to thirty six dollars a share, all while the book value was actually 55 so it you know this would be like in nvidia you know losing over well in this case the 50 percent of its value um going below whatever its concert uh considered book value is which would probably be more than 50 percent and probably be 80 90 percent at this point to go below its uh book value and you know he, he the point of this is that like such a solid company to be trading at below its book value is kind of like ridiculous and obviously a good opportunity to invest, I, I think. So then we have a really awesome footnote. I think this is by the commentator of this edition of the book. Again, the edition that we're using, the link to the whole book is in the description of this video. So um, if you, uh, uh, which I assume you're reading along with me. <clears throat> but anyway, I wanted to say, I don't let, I wanted to, you know, have this video, these videos be, mostly be my own commentary, but this comment was so good that I really wanted to include it. So I'll quote what he said, and I quote, recent history and a mountain of financial research have shown that the market is unkindest to rapidly growing companies that suddenly report a fall in earnings. <laughs> I mean... Can you believe how like applicable that is to today with, uh, you know, Microsoft, NVIDIA, AMD, these companies that have had enormous, uh, you know, growth. And then all of a sudden one report and it's like lower than, you know, another enormous, you know, giant leap in earnings. And then the, the prices start collapsing. Uh, it's pretty easy to see that one. Uh, it, it's been easy to see that one coming for forever now. But uh, anyway, uh, next quote. The biggest risks in owning... Uh, and he, this is also from the commentator. The biggest risks in owning growth stocks is not that their growth will stop, but merely that it will slow down. And I'm going to finish the chapter by staying. This is what I've been screaming forever regarding mega caps and... Uh, semiconductor companies in 2024. And that's all for Benjamin Graham's The Intelligent Investor, Chapter 12, Things to Consider About Per Share Earnings. The next uh, chapters get more and more into the details about how to uh, be valuing stocks and such. I hope you enjoyed. Thank you for watching, and see you next time at Rob's Child.